sir. Thank you very much, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. Um, first of all, I want to apologize to anybody walking in. That picture on the board is like 10 years old, so I promise it is actually me. It's just a balder, fatter, older version of me, but I, it's still the same. Distinguished. It's distinguished, exactly. I lost my clicker. Oh, here it is. Okay, so I'm going to quickly try, and again, I'll apologize in advance. Um, I'm not certain about the timing of this, so I may skip over some sections quickly or some sides quickly. If there's anything you'd like to see more of, if we get through the Q&A, uh, we'll try to go back and take a look at it. But then again, also, we can share this presentation. And if you have any further questions we can't get to here, please feel free to ask. So this is the 18th year that we have done this survey called the Trust Barometer with Element. And as I talked about last year, and as you may know, it is basically measuring the public's trust in four institutions, government, NGOs, media, and business. And each year, this takes on a little different dynamic. And obviously, in each country, and I think we're in 28 of them, it takes on a little bit different dynamic, depending on the landscape, depending on the political situation, depending on all sorts of factors. Every year, we try to anticipate what some of those dynamics are, what factors are going to play into people's mood and trust in these different institutions, and again, what that means, particularly for business, because as, um, as communication consultants, that's whom we advise. So we'll talk specifically about that. So we're gonna go through the general findings, some trends that we've seen this year. We're gonna go through specific activities as it relates to business, as it relates to the tech industry, and as it relates to Samsung. So first, each year since we've done it, we've kind of had an overarching reveal. We've had an overarching theme, one big takeaway from each one of the trust barometer surveys. Last year, I stood before you and I said what it was is the trust in crisis. And that referred to the fact that for the first time of 17 years that we've been doing it prior to that, trust in all four institutions fell. And again, as I spoke last year, it's usually a little bit of a rising ships. If one drops, the other one rises. It was the first time that we really saw all institutions fail. And for perspective, if you didn't see on the last slide, the survey is taken in the late fall, early winter. I think we wrap right around by the end of the year. So again, keep that in your, you know, on what's going on globally during those time periods. So in last year, when we had trust in crisis. It was right at the heart of the elections in the United States and a lot of populist visions all across the world and a lot of turmoil as it relates to that in many, many different countries. This year, we're calling it the battle for truth. And I'm talking extensively about that as we move forward. So, snapshot globally, there was no recovery in trust. Trust fell last year. There really hasn't been much of a move. If you look at it on the surface, globally, all the numbers look about the same. In terms of the general views, in terms of the general trust in these four institutions, the story, the difference, or the new thing last year was the dynamic of trust in all institutions fell for the first time. This year, for the first time, we're seeing what we call, and I'll say this a lot during the presentation, a polarization of trust. And what that means here is usually you start to see a global trend of rise or fall as it relates to trust in the institutions. Usually, if there's a downward trend, it tends to be six to nine countries that are, in the, that are falling significantly. So in order to make this list, that means that you dropped more than like 10, 11%, I think is the number. But this year, we actually saw it somewhat even. Six countries gained a significant amount of trust, while six countries lost a significant amount of trust. And all those in between were sort of fluctuating within the value of what we call normal, okay? And this is what it looks like. The polarization, this polls China, 27% increase in trust in the four institutions versus the United States, negative 37, which is the single largest drop in any country since we've been doing this in 18 years in all four institutions. Now, that may seem a little bit intuitive, understanding everything that's going on, but we're gonna dig, but obviously as soon as we saw that number, we started to dig deeper into it. So, it's a mess. It's a trust crash. One of the themes that I talked about last time I was here is I talked about one of the reasons for the growing polarization, one of the reasons for the 
the, the, the loss of such significant trust last year, especially in the United States, was this gap between the haves and the have-nots. If you go back to the first slide, and I'm so sorry I should have covered this on that slide, there were two types of people that we interviewed for this survey that we do the same every year. It's what we call general population and informed public. So general population is everybody. Informed pu public is a segment of that sample that is higher education, higher income, and they d digest news more than the rest of them, meaning that they look at newspapers three to five times a day or news sources three to five times a day. They're informed. So we call them the in informed public. The trust crash in the United States isn't necessarily, uh, you know, everybody's kind of coming more towards the middle. It was just a crash with the informed public. So whereas last year you saw pretty significant gaps, you had the haves, if we look at that model, the haves versus the have-nots, still had a little bit of faith in the system. They were still doing well. They didn't have reason to be concerned. The economy was doing well. They weren't quite as negative as general population. This year, most of the crash that you can see from that top line is from the informed public. So I don't necessarily call this a dynamic of people necessarily coming together as much as I would call it a dynamic of those informed public just kind of, you know, came down here where the general population was prior. But regardless, trust crash in the United States was absolutely significant. This is sort of an as expected, because we're gonna get into the media now, okay? So one, as I said, one of the four institutions that we look at is the media. And keep that phrase in mind, it's very important and we're gonna dive into it. This is no surprise, Clinton voters versus Trump voters, how they feel about trust in government and how they feel about trust in the media, right? The significant portion, the significant finding, remember when I said it was the battle for truth? Okay. Fake news is not just a real thing, it's a real dynamic. It is extraordinarily difficult to have any sort of a reasonable discord, to have any sort of a reasonable discussion on how we're going to approach challenging issues if we can't agree on the facts. The problem that we face, the biggest challenge that all these institutions face, is we are now living in a society, and it's global, it's amplified in the United States, where we can't even agree on the facts. It is the battle for truth. We, have, we saw this dynamic last year, where something like 60% of the people won't even read news sources that they don't feel are, shares their opinion. It is now amplified. They're not reading those sources. These people aren't reading that sources. There is no common ground. People don't know what to believe, and they're scared. Seven of 10 people globally believe that fake news can be used as a weapon. Not whether or not fake news exists, it's whether or not it can be used as a weapon. We saw this obviously in the United States. We are seeing it, we saw it in the South Africa election. And Germany and Singapore are now talking about actually legislating, making laws to govern news, to make certain that there are criteria that's met before you can put something out there. Sorry. <clears throat> As a result, media is now the least, least trusted institution. Significant drops in a lot of different places, but by and large, it's distrusted in 22 of the 28 markets that we surveyed. And here is the interesting dynamic. I don't know if anybody has ever seen this before, but this is what we have always called, this is sort of like the universe of communications for us at Edelman. It's a model that we came up with a few years ago and has evolved. But basically, there are platforms around the outside and content creators, publishers on the inside. And what we've always done, and what we've seen here in the trust barometer, is that there's always been a little bit of differentiator between news media and social and search. We've seen a rise in the terms of, of the influence of our peers, <coughs> thanks to social media. And I stood here last year saying for the first time, social media and peer-to-peer -peer was more trusted than actual news sources, likewise with search. What we found this year 
is we ask the question is what do you mean, what do you, what do you think of, what do you think we mean by the term media in general? Traditionally, and certainly someone in the communications business, we've always thought that there was the news media, which is the New York Times, Washington Post, television. Then there was search, which was Google and different platforms, and then there was social. We've divided our company based on those different disciplines. But actually what people are seeing is they lump it all together. They're now viewing the media as all those different channels. They do not differentiate between whether or not they're reading something on New York Times or whether or not they're reading it on Facebook. Regardless, they don't trust communications. It's not that they're not listening to CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or any of those things. They're not listening to people on social medias. They're not believing their search engines any longer. It is for the first time they've started to lump them into the same category. And this is where it gets interesting and a little bit confusing. So, I used to do political campaigns, and we would always have a funny saying is where the, like if you ask people their approval of Congress in the United States, Congress would have an approval rating of 25%. Then you'd ask them what do they think of their congressman who have served 30 years in that institution, and he'd have an approval rating of 80%. We hate Congress, but we love our congressman. We don't trust the media, but guess who had a sharp rise in influence in terms of trust? Journalists. When you use that phrase, journalists, they were managed to separate them out from the media, separate them from platforms. So journalists are kind of looking, and I'm, gonna, I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but again, this is the first time I've given this presentation, so I'm gonna kind of freewheel. Um, experts, academic experts, industry experts, have always been traditionally the most trusted people in any of these institutions that people would trust with news information, that trust with information. Journalists are now heading into that category. People are starting to see journalists, when you use them in the two terms, as someone who actually, now, if you ask them to name a few, I don't know who they'd name, because inevitably they're associated with the publisher or with the platform, but in large, they do trust journalists and people who practice the craft. Journalism more trusted than platforms. Platforms, remember, is that outer rim, social, search, and websites of media, publish, media publications. So journalism itself is actually more trusted. And this is where it gets interesting, and I'd love to, it's a much deeper conversation about what this is about, but people are starting to pick and choose different parts of that media. And it's gonna be really fascinating the way it falls out because the whole Wild West peer like myself is starting to wear thin on folks. I happen to believe strongly because it's at that divide. And if they start to think about journalism in its truest sense, in its truest form, as a craft, it is impartial. It is based on giving facts. They may not agree with the editors or the publications or the channels and that broad presence that exists within so many different publications. But they are starting to understand and differentiate that journalist. Trust in platforms decreased in 21 of the 28 countries. Okay, skeptical about news organizations. And again, I do understand what the, 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 the uh, jump that we're making here. We say journalists are trusted, but the news organizations are up, are, are down. So, in terms of attracting large audience, 66% are more concerned with attracting a big audience than reporting. So that means when we said, what do you think about news organizations, 66% of those polled said that they're more attracted with a big audience than reporting. They'll sacrifice accuracy to be the first to break a story and support ideology versus informing the public. So again, this is, this is enough with the noise as far as everyone is concerned. They don't know where to go, they don't know who to trust, they don't know who to listen to. But there are opportunities for people and influencers that are viewed as journalists rather than members of the media. Uncertainty over real or fake news, 63%. The average person does not know how to tell good journalism from rumor or falsehood. So that's a pretty important statistic to help us get to that dynamic, so think about that. Maybe what we're facing is it's a little bit of an aspiration. 
It's a little bit of an expectation. It's a little bit of people just kind of sitting back and saying, you know, all the noise in the news, everything. I'm craving for a journalist here to really help me explain, to help me understand all this. I'm craving for a true journalism to come back and start to present the facts as they're supposed to be, it's, it's supposed to be presented so we can get back to that conversation. Mealing, media failing to meet expectations. So in terms of trust building mandate, the three characteristics that people look for these media platforms and these publishers to behave, guard information quality, educate people on important issues, and inform good life decisions, they're basically getting failing scores on each one of those. There is a lot of work and a lot of repair that media and publishers are going to have to do to start to regain people's trust. Another statistic, lack of confidence in media undermining truth and trust. Percent of respondents who feel they're experiencing these consequences as a result of media not fulfilling its responsibilities. I'm not sure what's true and what's not, 59%. I do not know what politicians to trust, 56%, and I don't know what companies or brands to trust, which again, isn't as significant as the other two, but it's still over a third of the people. And we're gonna talk more about business later as there's some real opportunity here for businesses to lead. So, collapse of truth, a more skewed and complicated, to say the least, view of media, expectations on media, skepticism, the question then really becomes to us, then who leads the way? How do we get back to that public conversation? How do we get back to people not only just being able to talk to each other and solve problems, how do we agree on the facts in order to get there? Who do we turn to? So, as I said before, one of the big stories over the past several years in the trust barometer was the trust in a person like myself has been on an upward trajectory since we started doing this. I shouldn't say that, basically since the birth of social media in 2007, eight, however you want to say it. Last year we saw the first time as a person like yourself took over the number one spot. This year it's dropped six points. It's part that dynamic of we're lumping everything into that media bubble. It's part that dynamic of all these people, I, I know friendships that have been lost over the election. I know friendships that have been lost over social media posts. I know people that have been blocked. I know that I've blocked people. So this person like ourselves, this dynamic over the past year, and that lack of any sort of civil conversation and the ability not to agree on facts has really dropped down that person like ourselves. We're starting to question those folks. And it's risen back up the technical expert, and the academic expert, financial industry expert. It's those experts that they're looking for. And journalism, as I said there, journalist up 12, which means it was in the 20, it was down here last time, and we've seen a 12 point jump. Business is expected to lead. So this is a complicated part of the conversation, to be frank. Business necessarily isn't, it's not more trusted than any other institution. In fact, in most countries, it's far less trusted. I think even in this country, businesses, there's not a great deal of trust that they're gonna do the right thing for society. We're certainly not looking at them for you know, all the information as it relates to all the different aspects of these conversations in our life. However, there's an expectation, just like it is with journalism and the news, businesses are being looked to to lead this conversation, specifically tech, which we'll talk about in a second. But for CEOs, building trust is, is job one. Percentage that say the CEO should take the lead on change rather than waiting for government to impose it is 64%. It's basically what this is saying is something that we've been seeing now for quite some time. It is not enough just for businesses to do no harm. Business can't just go out and do their thing and sell their product, even if it's a good product, People nowadays want to hear and understand and know the company's value, know the company's corporate culture. They want to know who the company is. They want to have trust in that company in order to give them the business. It's no longer table stakes. It is absolutely a priority. Sorry, I'm going to skip ahead. 
employers trusted around the world. Seen some drops, seen some significant gains here in Western Europe. Uh, where is the United States? United States plus 15. This is their employers trusted around the world. So you ask specifically when you say employer, people tend to think of their company. So people are starting to believe that business, they don't necessarily believe businesses are doing the right thing, but they do believe businesses can do the right thing. And there are expectations. Businesses must commitment to show, show commitment to long-term, percent that agree that companies only think about themselves and their profits are bound to fail, 56%. CEOs more driven by greed than desire to make a positive difference in the world. Those are intuitive. We would have thought that. There's the gap between the haves and the have-nots. But from every different, every different thing that we're seeing, all the other data points, again, there is an expectation. There is, an, there is a desire to follow business. And there certainly is a willingness to listen. Okay, these are the specific sectors. We're gonna talk about tech soon, but tech has always been, and traditionally is, and continues to be, the most trusted, trusted sector. That has new dynamics associated with what we're gonna talk about in a minute. Education, 70%. Professional conservative, 68%. So what does that mean? What exactly are we looking for? What are those expectations on business? And, and this one I'm going to refer to my notes because it's a new slide. Okay, so we analyze trust building mandates for business. And there are basically markets with extreme trust gains. So these are the countries like China, UAE, South Korea, where had significant trust gains. Their priorities in order for businesses were invest in jobs, consumer safety, improve quality of life. Look at invest in jobs. Markets with typical changes in trust, that middle ground, once again, invest in jobs. In the, parts where, in the markets where it experienced extreme trust loss, extreme stuff, trust, trust deficit, it was guard information quality. Creating jobs isn't even on here. We haven't even gotten to that. It's sort of, I can't remember the name of the philosopher who or the scientist about the need hierarchy. Maslow. Maslow, thank you very much. It's sort of when things are good, hey, great, you know, everybody's happy, you're doing the right thing. Now go do your thing. Go, go create jobs. Go sell stuff. We're not even here. Consumer safety, safeguard privacy. Innovate here. We're going to get to the tech center in a second, but I wanted to wrap up just sort of the general findings of all this. The theme throughout, again, it is, this, it is this inability to agree on the facts. Trust is still in crisis, to be sure, nothing, else, nothing has necessarily rebounded, but it's taken a deeper dynamic and it is polarized, not as just by income and education level, it has polarized us, and I mean this globally, based on our inability to be able to come together and have any sort of rational conversations, whether that's one-on-one, -on -one, whether that's peer-to-peer, whether that's president to president. It's not existing. Business, media, government, and NGOs, particularly here, have an opportunity and obligation to step up and start providing that insight, helping us come together and standing for something broader than further polarization. It's going to be difficult, but for us in this room, as we're mainly up into this category, it's critical that there's a takes a leadership role. Every single one of these institutions has a role to play, as they always do, but there has to be some coming together. Okay. <clears throat> trust in technology. It's good news as always. Trust is always the most trusted sector. However, while that appears to look stable, five-year trends, negative one, roughly, um, it is the most trusted sector. They've suffered some losses on, whether, how the, on the scorecard on how technology is doing. So think about this for a second. And again, I might be jumping ahead of myself, but I want to say it now anyway. When you look at everything that's about to change for our society, 
it mostly centers around technology, artificial intelligence, automation, self-driving cars, AR, VR, all these different technologies of the connected world, right? Internet of Things is becoming a reality and we're starting to understand what exactly is gonna happen. And folks are a little bit scared. Folks are unsure about a lot of these technologies for many reasons. Data privacy, safety, their jobs as it relates to automotive. So frankly, while tech is a trusted sector because it's on everyone's mind and it's a transparent sector because everybody knows why tech is doing these things, there's still a lot of concern about whether how we're a tech can be doing better. There's not only expectation on tech, there's a responsibility on tech to help us navigate those waters because it's scary and change is happening extraordinarily fast. It's going to be very different five years from now, even more so than it was five years ago in terms of what we can do with our phones and what we can do with the connected world. So protects customer data, negative 18 from last year. Remember the, the down here is the 2017 numbers, top is 2018 numbers. Down 18. Transparent and authentic in how it operates, down 15. Leadership that effectively represents the interests of all stakeholders, down 11. Quality control at nine. So while on the surface, trust remains the most trusted sector of everything that we did in business, when you scratch a little bit deeper, it's not doing a very good job on those expectations. On how the public, on how consumers view the responsibilities and the mandates given to the tech industry, understanding all these changes that are coming, they don't think they're doing a very good job. Trust in technology declines in 18 of 28 markets. So again, globally, that number on the surface, still high, still up at around 75%. However, it's a little bit soft in some countries. They're not significant drops, but there's a lot of black up here versus what used to be pretty steady or at least moving in the right direction in white. Inform public, not quite as dramatic, except the polarization. Look at the gains here in tech and look at the losses here in tech. I don't think we saw any numbers like that in either direction on the general public. So it's the informed public, look at the US, once again, that's really starting to have these questions. So that dynamic that I just talked about, about the fear, the uncertainty, the new world and helping navigate it, the informed public is even more scared than the general in this regard. Okay, so this is where we dig a little deep, deeper than we just say tech industry. We're talking about specific innovations. These things that are going to happen that are gonna change the way that everybody operates is responsible, is, is, the tech industry is responsible for them. And while there's trust in technology, there's not a whole lot of trust here. They're still pretty much staying the same where they were last year. They certainly haven't fallen. But you gotta remember is that it's, it's, you know, not that much has happened. But now we've got Stephen Hawking's, we have Elon Musk, we have all sorts of different pretty smart people telling us that artificial intelligence is going to be the end of all things, jobs and personality and everything else in the world. People are starting to be scared about all these things. It's confusing. It's for, for, you know, for my generation, certainly, it's terrifying, and we don't know where it's gonna go. So technology has trust and has an opportunity, but it does have work to do, specifically for a company like Samsung that touches a great many of these things, right? It's important that they start to take a leadership role and start talking about these changes and what they're going to mean. So let's go to Samsung. As you can imagine, Samsung created a little bit of a bump, a little bit better than it was last year. Who can tell me why? Never mind, I won't, I won't make you say it. <laughs> last year, we took this survey during the Note 7 crisis, okay? So we have experienced some bumps, largely because of the S8 and Note 8 and the success of those phones. What's up with Japan? <laughs> I don't know. Can somebody, it, Japan is, I mean, I, I know just because I've been on this account now for five years, and the one thing I've always known is that Japanese hate Samsung. I don't think Koreans like Japan products much either, though, do they? So, no, that's always extraordinarily low. 
within form public, it's gone a little bit less. Hang on a minute. Okay, US, France, Hong Kong, Germany, it's actually even rose in Japan, I think for a couple different reasons. Once again, as we see with everything, it's a little bit more pronounced as people are starting to read. So some of the challenges that Samsung has faced over 2017, and specifically around the time this survey was being done, not a whole lot of the general population necessarily knew or were following it, unlike the Note 7, which is extraordinarily public and covered mass media here in the United States and elsewhere. Some of the challenges that Samsung has faced over the last year didn't necessarily receive as much coverage. Trust in Samsung over time. Been pretty consistent, except for the bump that we saw last year and the drop this year. Samsung less trusted than technology in 15 markets. This is new that start, again started last year. It's a, it's a, the dynamic with Samsung is when, you, when, you, when you're a company that a lot of people don't necessarily know a great deal about. There is not an iconic CEO. There is not a, an outspoken CEO. There is not a whole lot of an understanding of who Samsung is as a company. Even here in Silicon Valley, there's not a great deal of understanding. Your reputation tends to move much more dramatically with the products you sell. Do you see what I mean? Um, other companies can have a real bad day and have a real good product, but there's a, there's a little bit of a deeper relationship, a deeper understanding of consumers about what the company is. Well, again, when we talk back on those expectations, those are real. So it tends to come up, come up and down with products. So to rebound from something like the Note 7 takes a little bit of time, right? And so you have to come back with a Note 8, obviously was great. The S9 has been an amazing launch so far. So we're really starting to see those numbers come up again. Among the informed public, it's even more pronounced. Again, they tend to follow what's in the news much more closely. So let me get my notes here. <clears throat> okay, compared to other, I can't say what the other companies were, but compared to other tech companies, they're right around the same and even more than this other one and certainly more trusted than some of the other, some of the other industry companies, especially when we get down here to pharma which is obviously tech, usually the lowest, I believe. Tech company five is right here. Tech company one, tech company two. So again, about the middle, but Samsung used to be at the top of this list. Okay. This is one of the slides that I wanna close on. Tech companies expected to lead on social issues. 76% of the people agree companies should do help help regular people affected by automation, and tech companies should play a large role in educating future workforce to keep pace with emerging skills. One of the biggest fears that we've seen is people are afraid of losing their jobs. People don't understand, you hear all sorts of statistics about, for like my kids, 30% of the jobs that, are, that exist today won't exist when they're in the workforce. And that's a scary number because we all look around the room and wonder which 30% of us is going to lose our job. So the people that we surveyed, there is an expectation, and they believe a responsibility on the tech industry to start participating in what that conversation is going to look like. How are we going to help these displaced workers in the event that it does happen? Higher levels of trust in tech means people expect more from the leadership of the tech companies. As I stated early on in the presentation, as it relates to business and as it relates to media, there is an opportunity and an expectation that people are going to need media, business to lead. And in the tech industry, as the most, as number one, as the most trusted sector, and number two as, think about all those changes that are coming, think about all those fears that are, people are starting to generate and what that world's gonna look like, 
tech has got to not only participate, but lead in the conversation and help us all figure this out. So to summarize, um, first of all, we have a trust top 10 and an infographic that's here somewhere. Did we put them on the tables or, or right here in the front or over there on the side tables? I encourage you to pick it up. It gives a snapshot of all these. But again, to wrap up, the main findings again, first of all, the polarization of trust, meaning that you've got opposite ends. You have China over here that gained, I think, 27, and the U.S. over here that lost 35. I can't speak specifically to why China gained, but what you're seeing over there is actually trust in business in China went up. I think you can point to like Alibaba, Tencent, that are really starting to become true global market marketers, two global players, and they're starting to see them do things more on the world stage. Plus you have a growth in the middle class in China. <clears throat> the biggest growth in trust in the institutions in China was 18 to 34 year olds, which is a different dynamic. Well, I think the biggest drop of trust in the US was the same age group. Unsurprisingly, trust crash in the US, that's real. Immediately, widely redefined and distrusted, meaning we've all been lumped together. We can't agree on the facts. We can't have a conversation on facts that we can't even agree on. Experts rise, peers fall. Again, there's been a steady trajectory of trust in someone like myself that's now dropped and once again, we're looking at the technical experts, academic experts, to tell us what to do. Media is fractured. There's an uncertainty about it, true, but there's also a hunger and a look towards journalists to help lead the way out of it. Employers are, expect, are trusted, but expectations are high, and they're not doing a very good job on some of the core mandates that employees and consumers think they should be doing. Business must lead tech industry must lead and participate in the conversation and these change. We have to have a dialogue. We have to begin talking together. And maybe that's a good place to start. And maybe that's a good place to stop. So I can answer any questions. I actually got that done in much shorter time than I was hoping. So we do have time for some questions if anyone need it. So I have a question about uh, recent events. Yesterday, uh, probably one of the least trusted tech companies, if you call Uber a tech company, mm -hmm. uh, killed somebody. Uh, how does that play out in terms of the trust for a platform like ADAS? That's a great, great question. I, I think it, I, at this point, I don't know. I think the way that a crisis is handled when a company, when something so terrible happens and there's such a breach of that trust, what happens next over the next 48, 72 hours is imperative. I think if you look at, I don't want to name names, but if you look at certain ways companies have responded to tragedies, to poor customer service, to pets dying, to endangering consumer safety, how that company rebounds and how the industry rebounds really truly depends on how they own up to it. So I haven't seen what Uber's response has been on this, but if it's not the CBO stand, CEO standing at a podium, you know, taking full accountability and responsibility, and not just saying, you know, we're looking into it, but this is what's going to happen. And I think I, I will give credit, I think, to United Airlines, who has had certainly some significant challenges over the past couple of years. You're starting to see them do much because they were broadly criticized. Um, for the incident that happened with the passenger on the plane last year for not coming out immediately and saying this is not the kind of company we are we want to be they're, they're doing that now when they're facing you know the issues that they're facing today and i think it's really going to depend on how they do it but a crisis like you see the numbers with samsung with the note 7 how i don't want to say they're forgiving especially if somebody dies but if, you know, if your product doesn't perform well, if you put customers in danger, you, you have to step up and really start to own it and start to really articulate what it is you're going to do to not to, we're going to get to the bottom of this. This is how we're going to change and make sure this doesn't happen again. It's not the kind of company we are, but I don't know. Do you think they can crash the sectors? Yeah, I do. Yeah, I do. There starts to be distrust in it. There is, there's, this is, I think what was happened with Samsung, that was felt, I think, through the consumer electronics. 
I think it's fragile, especially in that sector. I don't know, is Uber considered a tech company? Not really. They're like services, aren't they? Or, but, um, they have an app. Huh? They have an app. Yeah, they have an app. So I think it's, I think it's gonna be interesting to see. I don't know. I honestly, gosh, don't know. It just, it's going, but it's large, it's on Uber to make sure that they do it. But it, it can affect the sector, yes. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Who is a uh, informed person versus mm -hmm. a non-informed person? What's the criteria for that? Great, yeah. So she's asked, what, what's the difference between, how do we de differentiate between an informed public and general public? Informed public are people that have higher income levels, are higher educated, completed more education, and digest news on a more regular basis. So read more, inform themselves more. That's sort of how we do it. Uh, this is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> okay, great. So I, I, I'm going to make an observation first, and that yeah. is that trust is not unlike capital in that when there's not a good place to invest it, there's real opportunity. Right? Yeah. So. Good point. Uh, but given that, uh, how do you expect to evolve this survey? I think that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Every year it's surprising where we go. And again, I'll just to be completely transparent, I'm not part of the team that does the survey. I'm part of the team that then presents it and they give me all their findings. And I know that we are given the survey early on and start, lots of times we go back. So for example, last year before the election, we were doing the survey and then the election happened. We went back and started to poll between Trump and Clinton voters. This year, when we saw the fact that everyone lumped media in the same category, that's when we really started to drill down, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, specifically, what do you think about these different voices? That's where we found the nuggets of the fact that, well, no, I like journalists. I just don't think there are many journalists, <laughs> you know, was sort of the answer. So a lot of it is nimble. A lot of it is just kind of looking at the world is gonna be very different next fall than it was last fall. It certainly was between these two years. So I think the first stage, you know, we just get together and just sort of look at what the rhetorical landscape is, look at the mood. We have offices in every country, so we engage our whole global network and start to talk about these different dynamics and just start intuitively, what do we know and what do we look for? What I can say right now is for next year, I guess I'd like to drill, I'd like to drill more down into the business aspect of this. What are, I mean, we have those mandates and we do have, you know, we do understand that there's an opportunity, but somewhere there's a little bit of a gap. If we're telling businesses they must lead and there's expectations on it, why aren't they more trusted? Why does it continue to fall? Is it because they're failing? So I'd like to drill a little bit more down into the mandates and the expectations if I have a say in it. But again, we'll, we'll make this, we'll start talking about that like in September. Okay, anyone else? Well, thank you again for having me. I appreciate it, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir.